now. All right, so we're delighted to welcome Professor Katie Tamulonis with us today from up at Allegheny College. Katie was an adjunct faculty for us. I believe it was when Dr. Campbell was on sabbatical. So she Dr. Schiappa. Dr. Schiappa was yep. on sabbatical. Yep. So the, the good professor is a sedimentologist. And uh, having her in our company today reminds me that it's a good opportunity to speak about the academy. And one can get to think that the United States of America is a huge place and that the academy is immense. But once you start get, becoming a scholar, you start to realize that your community is actually maybe smaller than you would have thought. And I think of it like a spider web, you know, when a bug lands in the web, then the, you don't know where the spider's coming out from and everything is interconnected and the web starts to twitch. Um, and Katie had a uh, wonderful undergraduate sedimentologist named Marcus Key. And it turns out I've met Marcus, and in fact, he was my own daughter's senior thesis advisor. So in a very interesting spider web sort of a way, the good professor and I have had some mutual acquaintances, and they have led us to collaborate. And those of the students who were in glacial geology a semester ago, we're actually benefiting from some of Professor Tamulonis's work in the sedimentology of glacial deposition and the wonderful resources that we have in our neighborhood in Western PA. So I've been lucky to have additional interactions and I'm really delighted that you've been able to join us today with no further ado, Professor Tamulonis of sedimentology at Allegheny College. Hi everyone. Um, as as uh, Dr. V had said that I, I spent a wonderful year at Slippery Rock, which I really enjoyed so much. So I'm very excited to uh, be visiting you folks again. Um, if the title of my talk is Devonian Shale Geology in the Rome Trough Appalachian Basin, USA. And um, as was previous, previously stated, I'm at Allegheny College, so just a little bit north of Slippery Rock. Um, and before I get started, just if there are any questions, I am not good at multitasking and like monitoring chats while I'm, you know, giving a, you know, delivering um, information. So just, I would really say, feel free to to uh, speak up during during the talk, and and we can have a conversation right then or there. Or you know, of course, hold your questions towards the end. But I, I am not opposed to people um, asking questions in you know while I'm going through the slides. So before we get started too much, I, I have to make a couple of acknowledgements. The American Chemical Society Petroleum Research Fund uh, provided some money for this research, and I have to write that down, I guess, um, in the beginning of these talks. A bunch of folks at Allegheny College, um, students and our technicians, folks from the Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia Geological Surveys, in particular, Chris Carter, um, who is assistant state geologist, is you know, for some of this work, especially the Petraska, uh, like looking at SEM data and petrographic data, um, she's done just as much work as I have. And I, she's been an amazing person and research, uh, the survey has been an amazing resource to work with. Lee Avery from the West Virginia Geological Survey. And then at the end, I'm going to show you some data um, some from an actual well field. And that data was shared by Noble Energy which has been brought by, by Chevron in the last year. So I don't know who to thank, Noble Energy or Chevron. Uh, let's just, so I'll thank both of them. So just to give you so, folks some background, I'm going to show a lot of data in, a, in the course of this talk. And I'm going to explain what that data is. And some of it's looking at you know, traditional data to look at some of these shales uh, or traditional methods of examining these shales and then some, some methods that are a little bit not traditional. Um, and there's been, a, you know, really my motivations for this project have changed kind of drastically since I started it, which I think happens oftentimes in the course of any sort of science. Originally, I was wondering what are the differences between these organic rich black shales that were deposited in the Appalachian Basin during the Devonian period. 
Um, and then specifically, I was wondering how this structure within the Appalachian Basin called the Rome Trough affected the stratigraphy and sedimentology of those shales. And then specifically, where were those shales deposited? Where are they deposited in you know, thicker areas throughout that structure? And I'll show you pictures and explain to you um, where these shales are and where the trough is in a second. So now the motivation is still what I just said, but while I was trying to answer those above original questions, we noticed that they, it looks like these shales have been pretty significantly altered, um, but pro probably by some hydrothermal fluids, not everywhere, but in certain portions of this foam trough. And then I started thinking, what are some other data sets that we can use to like not, you know, these, these non-traditional data sets that we could use to understand maybe how this trough is structured. And I decided to start what, you know, data mining is kind of this hot topic right now um, and decided to, uh, or, you know, buzzword, buzz phrase, decided to look into a bunch of engineering data. So data that's not really recording the geology, but recording engineering parameters when they're drilling wells in some of these shales. So why, so these shales are unconventional uh, resources within our basin, um, and they're not the same. They don't seem to be the same. How are they different and why are they different? And then specifically, how do faults affect these reservoirs? Or reservoir quality, um, even, is there any gas within these reservoirs when they are close to faults? And it looks like there was fluid flow along these faults. So what facilitated fluid flow and when did that happen? And how are we doing this? Well, you can't see that part of it. Um, we're looking at a bunch of different data sets, geophysical logs, core, mineralogy, total organic carbon, using a bunch of data, uh, engineering data, and then incorporating that into what I'm calling a geo model. And I'm going to explain to you what all of these, these words mean if, if they're new to you. So the talk outline is the first thing I'm going to do is introduce what is the Rome trough? What are these Devonian shales? And what are some of these data, um, data sets that we're going to look at? And those data sets include well logs, core that's collected from wells, and then some of this drilling and completions data. And I'm just going to give it a very brief, um, high level uh, overview so you folks can just get a general understanding of how the data is collected and what does it represent. Because a lot of times, I'm not actually looking at rocks, I'm looking at proxies for rocks that's collected from the subsurface. We'll show some preliminary work on the sequence stratigraphy and depot centers of these shales within the Rome trough. Um, and that's going to be pretty short because I can't figure out where I saved, <laughs> saved some of my maps and some of my figures, especially since I'm uh, working at home. Um, so I'll give you some examples of how the stratigraphy of these shales uh, is different, how these depot centers raise a lot of questions, but I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna touch on those things. I'll spend some more time looking at some um, some, some results that suggest that portions of these shales have experienced some hydrothermal alteration. Give a little uh, blurb about data mining and how to make geo models. And that's a pretty complicated methodology and there's a lot of math involved in that. So, so I'll, I'll touch on that, but I really wanna show you what these geo models, why they're important and what, what they can tell us about the structure and the stratigraphy within portions of the room trough. And then some conclusions, and I would say the conclusions should really be titled conclusions slash more questions. So let's, let's show you where we're looking at first. So here we are in Pennsylvania. You folks are up here. This core, this um, star here is uh, the location of a core that was collected in southern Allegheny County, so south of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's up, up here somewhere. What these contour lines are showing is a thickness of the Marcellus Formation. And over here we have a stratigraphic column showing the middle to upper Devonian stratigraphy and pretty much a southwest portion of the um, Appalachian Basin. Uh, the Marcellus Formation is deposited in the middle Devonian, is a basal group or is a basal member of the Hamilton group. And you can see here it's divided up into what we call the Union Springs member, the Cherry Valley Limestone, and the Owatka Creek member. 
And then above the Marsalis formation is something called the Skinny Atlas formation. And this is nomenclature that's been, um, that, that the P Pennsylvania Geological Survey is utilizing. So people uh, in different states, or even if you're working for a different company, might not specifically use, you know, divide the Marcellus Formation into the Skinny Atlas Formation, but this is a nomenclature that I've adopted. Um, then we have a bunch above the Skinny Atlas Formation, we have some, you know, gray shales and limestones. The gray shales are this, these white blobs or white squares of the Ludlowville Formation, the Tickner Limestone of the Moscow Formation, which is mostly gray, sh gray shale, the Tully Limestone, and then above the Tully Limestone, we have what, what I'm calling the Genesee Formation, which is another black shale. This gray over here means that it's an it's a organic rich black shale. Some people call the Genesee Formation or the basal portion of the Genesee Formation in Pennsylvania, we're calling it the Geneseo Shale. That's also known as a Burkett Formation if you're in New York, sometimes if you're in portions of West Virginia. And then the West River member of the, oops, of the Genesee Formation, which overlies the Geneseo. So the formations that, or the shales that we're looking at are highlighted in red here. And the area that I'm interested in is this area that's outlined in pink. And that's what we're calling the Rome Trough which is this big structural graben that extends throughout portions of the Appalachian Basin. It's not the entire basin, um, down all the way into Kentucky, through West Virginia, throughout Pennsylvania, and into portions of uh, Southern New York. And I sometimes think it might, that where the Rome Trough extends is, is larger than what this pink blob is that I'm showing. And all of these uh, green lines on this map are um, faults, whether they're basement root at faults or not basement root at faults, but you can see there's a number of regional faults that um, cut through the Rome trough. So let's talk a little bit more about the Rome trough. Um, and what I'm showing you here, I'm sorry if you can hear stomping above me or if you can hear uh, the screech of a violin. My, my third grader is, is taking an online violin <laughs> lesson right now. And I think my kindergartner is, uh, must be pretending he's a monster somewhere in my house. So, so apologies for that. Um, let's look at this. These are some figures, and I know they're a little bit small, but this is uh, figures from a paper published in 2000 by Gao et al. From, they were from uh, a lot of work from West Virginia University. And the Rome Trough is a southwest or, or northeast southwest trending graben. And initially it formed during the Cambrian. Uh, associated with rift, rifting that was, um, again, associated with the spreading of the Iapetus Ocean. And it's been reactivated throughout the Paleozoic. It has a complex structural architecture. Um, and what this paper shows is that there's divided up into different segments. So whether, whoops, keep forwarding, sorry about that. We have our Eastern Kentucky segment, a Southern West Virginia segment, and then a northern West Virginia, Pennsylvania segment. So they have this 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 trough that kind of is a, is is uh, oriented in this northeast southwest fashion, and then it's segmented. Uh, it's cut by what we're saying are cross structural discontinuities that trend in the northwest southeast fashion. These subsegments have varying reactivation histories. So throughout the Paleozoic, we had a number of or orogenies and it reactivated this previously existing trough. And we think that it did um, create these low relief inversion structures as the basin developed. And really, we know a little bit about it. What we have here is a, a cartoon picture of what was a regional seismic line that goes through the, the graben. So here you can see that we have a relatively, if we're in this northwest portion of the seismic line within the trough, we have much thick, thicker sediment, a sedimentary package than the areas outside of the, graph, the trough. So we know about that. These big regional seismic lines provide a lot of uh, information against you know, kind of regional structures, but it's kind of, it's very hard. It's much more complicated than what these regional uh, re this regional data is showing. And there's been a lot of 
effort into understanding um, kind of the finer scale structure of the trough because the trough does have a history of hydrocarbon generation and production, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Here are some paleogeo, so let's talk about the shales quickly. Um, these are our paleogeographic maps, Middle Devonian map here, and our late Devonian map here. So about 385 million years ago to 306, 360 million years ago. And our study area is right here. So you can see our, we have our Acadian orogeny happening over to the east, of, or the east of our study area. And our study area is primarily covered with this, by the shallow inland sea. So what ha was happening is we had sedimentation moving westward from the Acadian highlands into the shallow uh, Epiric Sea. And that is when the Marcellus Formation was deposited in the Middle Devonian. And the Late Devonian, we still have this is pretty much the same tectonic scenario. We have our Acadian orogeny over here, sedimentation moving from east to west into the shallow sea. We have a bit of a sea level transgression between them. So, but very similar um, depositional settings, similar tectonic regimes for the deposition of both of these. Marcellus Formation and the Genesee uh, Shale. And this is just a cross section. Um, and this is from the USGS. It's not really that great of a resolution, but we're moving from central Pennsylvania um, westward into the, uh, central Ohio. And you can see that here down here is our Marcellus Formation. Up here is what's labeled as a Burkett Shale, which is the same thing as this Geneseo Shale. So you can see they're separated by what is in this figure called the Mont Montongo Formation, which over here we're still calling part of this Hamilton group. Um, and eventually as you move westward, these shales kind of converge, the sediment package becomes uh, much thinner as we move to a much dis more distal location within the basin. So let's talk a little bit about these, these organic rich shales produce natural gas. And they've been a subject of study for you know, government agencies, the USGS, the Pennsylvania and West Virginia geologic surveys, plus all of the oil and gas operators that used to be pretty active in the basin and might not be so active nowadays because of the uh, low commodity prices. But what this, what this picture here is showing is from the Energy Information Administration, which is a government and, and a, uh, government agency. And all these dots here are just wells that were drilled um, in the Appalachian Basin. And the different colors show the cumulative production. So pretty much the darker colors up here, those wells have produced more natural gas than the lighter colors down here. These gases, are more, they're mostly drilled in the Marcellus Formation um, between two, 2011 and 2016, over 12,000 unconventional wells were drilled in the basin and 85% of those wells were completed within the Marcellus organic rich shale. Also, those could be the play, the Marcellus play and the uh, Burkett or the Geneseo play uh, overlap with the Marcellus. So there was, they were drilling in some of these upper Devonian shales as well that don't necessarily produce as much as the Marcellus formation. So you can see here, this is where the Marcellus Formation is thickest in northeastern Pennsylvania. And that's where we have the highest cumulative production, the darker colored wells. And down here, we have still a lot of wells drilled within this portion of, the, this is where the Rome Trough is located. And it doesn't necessarily have the, um, the cumulative production that these wells have, but they have, they have um, natural gas liquids. So things like ethane and propane and butane associated with them, which are valuable um, man for manufacturing. So sometimes I like to think about it, you get a little bit more bang for your buck down here. So having those natural gas liquids, depending on, on what the price of oil and gas is, can be a little bit more valuable than just having a whole bunch of natural gas coming out of these wells up here. So the reason I was explaining that is because I'm going to use a lot of data that has been supplied from uh, the wells that were drilled in these unconventional reservoirs. So some of the data I'm going to show you are well logs. And I imagine some of you might be very familiar with well logs and well core, um, but I'm going to just give a quick uh, 
you know, overview of what these things are in case this is the first time you've heard them. So we'll look at data collected from well logs, well core, and then end, what I'm calling engineering data collected during drilling and completion operations of some of these wells. So data that isn't reflecting the geology, but isn't reflecting um, engineering parameters, such as how fast is the drill bit moving through some of these organic rich shales? And then also, what pressures do you need to fracture these wells? And I'll review what, at what we're specifically talking about in a couple of slides. So the data from the well logs, and this is just a general schematic of how well log data is collected. They drill a well. The well is usually open. There's not any steel casing around the well if you're just drilling a vertical well. Um, you drop a tool down the well and then you slowly pull, pull the tool up the well and it will measure variables that are directly related to the geology that the well is drilled through. Um, and you can interpret what is happening uh, how maybe lithologies are changing as you move up that well. Sometimes you can actually collect data as the drill bit is moving through the rock, and that's called measuring while drilling data, MWD data. Um, but typically for some of, for the vertical wells, you, you drill the well and then you drop, this is a tool and it has this very, you know, tens of feet long and has a bunch of, um, you know, electronics gathered to it, sends signals up to the truck, and then it produces these squiggly curves. And those squiggly curves are measuring parameters that we can use as proxies as true rock, or as to what the rock type is. I'll show you an example. Um, the the mo one that I'll talk about the most is something called a gamma log. So this is a gamma log, and this is this is just a pretend, it's a pretend graphic I made up for one of, for a class. And this squiggly thing is showing uh, variations in the gamma ray reading as it was drilled down, as it was collected within this well. This is, let's say, core that was collected from the same well, which is basically if you're just drilling the well and instead of crushing up all the rock, you try and collect it in a, in a continuous, well, not continuous, you try and collect it in a cylinder and bring the samples up to the surface intact. And all these different uh, patterns over here represent different types of sedimentary rocks. So is it a conglomerate or a sandstone um, or a shale? And this squiggly lines are gamma ray log. And let's just say there's low gamma over here where it's zero, and there's high gamma over here where it's 100. And it's measured in gamma ray API units, which is just something that was, um, you know, a, a measuring unit that was established by the oil and gas industry. And what these gamma ray logs measure is the natural radiation or the radioactive decay that occurs in rocks. Because all these rocks have radioactive isotopes such as uranium, thorium, and potassium that are naturally part of that rock. And in general, we have a rule of thumb that mudstones, shales, siltstones, um, things that are made of aluminum, silicate minerals, and if they have a lot of organic debris, will have much higher, higher gamma ray readings than uh, rock types such as carbonates or maybe a very clean quartz sandstone, they'll have low gamma ray readings. So over here, we'll say this is a high gamma ray, ray reading that's associated with this shale here, associated with this coal layer here. Down here, we have a really low gamma ray reading, then that's associated with, let's say, a very clean quartz sandstone. Carbonates will also have this very low, a similar low gamma ray reading. So it's important to realize that rocks of different rock lithologies may still produce similar gamma ray patterns um, or measurements. So there's a whole suite, other suite of uh, well logs that you have to use to like kind of understand, okay, like, are we looking at a sandstone or are we looking at a carbonate? And those well log, those like a density log is a pretty important um, data set to have in conjunction with gamma ray logs. But we're going to just focus on the gamma ray right now. And so some of these uh, data sets are collected from vertical wells that are just build, drilled in a vertical fashion, usually pretty quickly um, from the surface. 
But we're also going to look at data that's collected from horizontal drilling. Horizontal drilling in these unconventional shale reservoirs, which you drill down vertically. And then at some point you, you start doing what is called, you build a curve and you change from a vertical to a horizontal drilling motion. And while they're drilling horizontally within this unconventional reservoir, and we're calling it unconventional because that's not conventionally the way that we uh, humans uh, typically would drill wells until you know the last 20 years or so. Um, and the reason we're drilling horizontally is because that's the way that we can access the most natural gas or natural gas liquids that are, are still hosted within the organic rich shales. So we're gonna look at some data sets that are collected during this horizontal drilling, um, something called rate of penetration. And that is just how fast is the drill bit? So the drill bits located down here, how fast is that drill bit moving through the reservoir rock? The res that whether it's the Marcellus formation or the Geneseo formation. Because I think rate of penetration can tell us a lot of things as what about the, how uh, is there, is it the reservoir uh, homogenous or not? Are we entering areas that have you know, changes in stress regimes, changes in mineralogy? And the other thing that we're going to look at is something called dog leg severity. And all that is, is measuring, so this, the drill bit is down here. And usually you're trying to drill that well as straight as you can, because if you're drilling straight without changing the direction very often, it means you're going, to, you're going to drill the well faster. You're going to have an easier time actually putting, putting the uh, steel casing down those wells and getting, and then also retrieving everything from the bottom of the well. Imagine that if it was like drilled in a, in a corkscrew fashion, it's going to be hard to get that drill bit back up the well when you're done drilling it and then putting steel casing down there. Um, and then completing the well, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and also they think the more kind of tortuous the path of the well is, it might say that that well might not produce as much natural gas or natural gas liquids because it'll kind of get held up within all those, those turns in the well. So dog leg severity is measured in degrees per 100 feet. So how, how many degrees per 100 feet of lateral length does the drill bit change? So usually if we're trying to drill as straight as possible, you know, you're hoping for zero degrees per 100 feet, one degree per, per 100 degree or per 100 feet. Um, anything over kind of if there's a three degree change per 100 feet, that's a pretty significant change in the drill bit over that short period of time. And then the last thing we're gonna look at um, is data that's collected when they hydraulically, hydraulically frack the wells, um, or it's called fracking, right? And after they drill the wells, this horizontal portion of the wells, they'll bring the drill bit back up, and then they'll put completion tools down there, and, and they go all the way to the end of the well and work their way back up to the top of the well, and they use lots of sand and water to do this, millions of uh, gallons per well. And the first thing they have to do is create these fractures in these rocks. And after they create the fractures of the rocks by putting a lot of water, very high pressures down the well bore. So the fractures are created, then they pump a lot of sand into those fractures to keep those fractures open. So if this is a, a review to you folks, um, you know, I apologize, but I just wanna make sure everyone's kind of on the same page before we, we look at what some of this data can tell us. And then the last thing we're looking at is well core. So these cylinders of when you're drilling the horizontal or the vertical portion of the well, you put on a special drill bit that instead of crushing up all the rock and spitting it back up to the surface, we'll collect the rock in these cylinders and you can mark the depths at which the core was collected and then bring them up and look at them and, and you know, actually have hand samples and describe the sedimentological features of um, of that core, and this is a, this is a core from this is a Marcellus formation core, and this is a Geneseo formation core. So to me, kind of boring. I mean, initially when I looked at these, I thought, oh gosh, these just look like black shale. This is going to be a great project. 
Um, and I, I'm saying that in a sarcastic tone, but then we threw them underneath a microscope and oh boy, there's lots of stuff going on. So I know I was just talking a lot about well data and, and horizontal drilling and, and drilling these unconventional wells and all the data. And the thing is, is I, I'm not really here to promote let's drill or let's, let's not drill. What I'm here to say is that there's a lot of data out there from these companies that have been drilling wells all throughout our basin. And what I'm interested in doing is using that data, understand how portions of this basin, you know, specifically within the Rome trough, how do they work, right? How is this working? How, how can we understand the tectonic and depositional history from all this data that's collected from these, um, collect, collected in the subsurface from these wells. So the first thing I'd like to show you is, is the stratigraphy as represented in these gamma logs. So here's a gamma log and it was collected right here. So within the, this Northern West Virginia portion of the Rome trough, um, it looks very different. These gamma ray patterns look very different than if you compare it to wells that look that are outside of the room. And this is something that I don't really have the answers to, and I couldn't find some of my nice nicer figures for this. But let's look at this this gamma ray log. I would say this is a very variable gamma ray log. The scale goes from zero over here, so low gamma ray values over here, to high gamma ray values over here, which are about six hundred. And I, I, everything has been normalized. And the depths we're looking at, you know, let's, this is about 6,000 feet below the surface. Um, and the reason that we're looking at this, this was an area where they were developing uh, Marcellus wells for production. And the, the, it is very variable. We see high peaks, low peaks, high peaks, low peaks. And what I did for, by looking at these gamma logs and then in conjunction with some density logs and porosity logs, realize that it looks like this is divided up into what I'm calling three stratigraphic sequences. Three third, they're third order stratigraphic sequence. And each one of these sequences is representing kind of a, a relatively minor uh, sea level rise and then sea level, where's my pointer? Sea level rise and then a sea level fall. Sea level rise and then we have a sea level high here then a sea level fall. And we're and interpreting these lows to be carbonate rich layers that would have been deposited in, you know, kind of a shallower, um, you know, clear, clearer uh, depositional environment. This here, this is the highest organic peak that I that we have. And it was, this is where they drill the horizontal wells because this is the highest gamma logs and the, uh, or where we have the highest gamma reading. And it's actually silica rich and it's easy to drill through. So this is a well that was collected from a, a field here. But let's compare it to what we see a well from to the west of the trough here and then a well to the east of the trough. So this well is from Washington County, Pennsylvania over here. And this well is to the east of the trough, trough in uh, Fayette County. And the work that's been published on this um, specifically by, by the group at Penn State, Terry Engelder, and, and uh, this is by a, uh, oh, I see a chat. Let me make sure I'm, hey, oh, hey, shout out to Fayette. Um, what we see here is they divided it up, it up into two stratigraphic sequences instead of three. And of course, this is much thicker, right? And you think that makes sense if we're in the more proximal areas, but why are some of the areas that, you know, we're a little more distal over here, but why do we see, it seems like we're seeing a greater variation within the Marcellus Formation stratigraphy. We're seeing different number of sea level rises and falls compared to areas outside of the trough. Pardon me for a second. Hey, buddy, upstairs, please. Sorry, kindergartner on the loose. Um, so we're seeing these variations in stratigraphy from within and outside of the trough. Why are we seeing that? Well, I'm not sure. And we, there, we have more data. Um, and I'll show you an example of so, some of these uh, data or where some of these wells are that we're looking at. 
Um, we looked at all of these wells, all of these little uh, white squares here are all um, wells that are located in the northern West Virginia. So it's kind of hard to see. Here's, a, here's West Virginia. This is Pennsylvania. Over here is in Ohio. So we are focusing our efforts for this, um, looking at, at these wells within the southern West Virginia segment of the trough and the northern West Virginia segment of the trough. And what we were mapping here was how thick is the Marcellus Formation? And the oranges, the, the lighter, you know, warmer colors mean it was thicker um, over uh, 100 feet here. The cooler colors mean that it was less than five feet or non-existent uh, down here, but that's just a remnant of not really having data, any data down here um, to, you know, provide a pattern other than it looks like it's thinning. But what we can see throughout the trough is that it looks like we do have these localized depot centers. We have this, this depot center right here, relatively thick area, um, relatively thinner area here, and a relatively thicker area here um, that seem to cut across the trough. And when we look at what is happening to depot centers, where do we have these big thick so this is, you know, just a thickness map of the Marcellus. When we compare to the thickness map of the Marcellus in this region to the thickness map of the gen overlying Geneseo Burkett, we see similar patterns. We see these, these, these uh, more localized depot centers, but they're not exactly in the same areas. I thought they would overlap. So we're seeing changes in stratigraphy. We're seeing some three, some uh, wells down here have three third order sequences. Some of them have two. Um, so what is causing these changes in the number of sequences and this kind of like, um, and where these depot centers are located? And the hypothesis is that the trough was, has been reactivated during these, while these res reservoirs were, or while these um, unconventional reservoirs were being deposited, but it was changing throughout the middle to upper Devonian. We see evidence of hydrothermal alteration too. And that's, we're looking at that core that I was, was showing you, which is really on the Western, um, you know, this Western flank of the Rome trough right here is located in Southern uh, Allegheny County. And it's call, called the EGSP2 core. Um, yes, I think so, Tamara. I think you're right about that. Um, so we'll, let's look at some of the, um, some thin sections that we collected from this core here. Uh, so it's really just on this like Western extent of the Rome trough. This core was uh, originally, whoop, we'll zoom in on this area then. This is a map of, so the top of the Marcellus formation structure. So this is mapping, the topography of the top of the Marcellus formation in this portion of the Rome trough. And you can see it's a little more complicated than what, you know, these big regional pictures are, you know, more regional maps are showing. And so the, the topography is not flat, right? But the big thing I'd like you folks to note is that this here, that where we have this star, is where we found that core or where that core was collected. And it's pretty close to these red lines and these brown lines. And this brown line is what we're calling a cross-structural discontinuity. It's named the Pittsburgh Washington lineament. And then these basement rooted faults, which are mapped in red here. So it's not directly on top of those, but it's kind of in an area where some of these uh, northeast, uh, southwest trending basement faults are, uh, are kind of intersecting this Pittsburgh Washington lineament. So we looked at this core. It was collected by the Department of Energy in 1979. So it's been sitting around for a while. That's, um, that's important when we look at some of this bulk mineralogy. But basically what we did was, uh, and this is working with Chris Carter at the survey, described the core, looked at the uh, geophysical logs, looked at the uh, XRD bulk mineralogy and thin sections. And I think I'm just going to probably show you the, the, the data from the thin sections that, you know, again, made me scratch my head. We have other chemical analyses. Um, we looked at TOC and we're looking at some, some isotopes from, from these. And again, the big, 
but the big question, what's the sedimentological difference of these, of the Marcellus formation and the, um, and the Geneseo formation? Are they all the same? They look the same when you're looking at those, when you initially take a look at those cores, uh, uh, this is gonna be a, a pretty boring project. This is gonna be black shale description for the entire length. But when you look closely at them, and this is a very busy, oops, excuse me, very busy picture, I realize that. This is, these are well logs over here. But what I'd like you to focus on is this column here. And this is just a cart, you know, my graph, like cartoon of a description of the core. And each one of these patterns represents a different lithophases. And generally these, these lithophases range from carbonate rich organic poor gray shales um, to black organic rich silica rich black shales. But there's, and on all of this, and then we, we, ca we, look, we catalog the microfossils there to, to the extent that we were able. And then over here we have total organic carbon and then this XRD data. But what I'd like to show you, so th this one was for the Marcellus, the middle Devonian section of the core. And then I did the same description for the upper section, the Genesee, Genesee formation of the core. And what I noticed was when I started defining these lithophases is that I thought they'd all be the same and they are not all the same. Um, the lithophases do not necessarily overlap for this, um, this upper section of the core. And also we see differences in the XRD bulk mineralogy. So let's look at what we decided to do then. So the comparison is that the, this is just generally showing um, biology could be, I, that was what uh, Tamara, I think that it could, initially that was my thought, but we'll show you some, some things that we saw that really kind of overprinted a lot of the primary sedimentological and biological features. Um, so just a, the quick comparison was that in the middle Devonian, the quartz content appears to be more disseminated. So maybe like more of a biological origin, I think, compared to this upper Devonian, the Genesee formation, the quartz appears to be more detrital. The lithophases do not overlap. Where we have low TOC um, in the middle Devonian, usually you associate that with higher carbon and content. And that wasn't the case for the middle Devonian. It was the case for the upper Devonian. The big thing for the upper Devonian is that usually I associate the high TOC content to be is, is areas with that are quartz rich. And the upper Devonian was plagioclase rich. So that was interesting. That's when I really said, what the heck's going on here? And we have more cross-cutting microveins in the middle Devonian than in the upper Devonian. And that's from looking at things underneath the microscope. So this is just some uh, looking at some thin sections that were collected. So, so at each, sorry, at each one of these red stars, we collected um, a sample and made a thin section out of it. And this is where we, we started realizing, we're, what, what the, you know, what are some of these features that we're seeing? It's hard to understand, make the, the sedimentological comparisons because it looks like there's a lot of but we're saying alteration going on here. And some of it's just kind of typical diagenetic features that you expect to see. But other times it's not, we're seeing things like alteration halos surrounding some, uh, some veins that are, are vertical veins. We're seeing lots of cross-cutting micro, micro veins and veins of different compositions. We're seeing, um, plagioclase filled veins, a lot of matrix replacement by calcite. And then over here, zones of euhedral pyrite. So all of this black, these black um, blobs there are pyrite, euhedral pyrite crystals. And then a lot of what, uh, what's surrounding it is muscovite. So we started to look at some of this stuff in a little bit more detail underneath the SEM, scanning electron microscope. Um, and look, I really wanted to pay attention to what are we seeing in some of these veins. And, and this is not unusual to, to find these veins and the subhorizontal, I'm calling them anastomosing vein microfractures that are filled with organic matter. A lot of times organic matter moves into these fractures. Here we're seeing these uh, subhorizontal microfractures. So fractures that you wouldn't see normally just looking at a hand sample, right? 
they're filled with gypsum. That's not so unusual. They're rimmed with, um, they're rimmed with organic matter here. Down here, we started finding microfractures that are filled with plagioclase, which is what the P is there. Um, and then, sorry, and then over here, we're seeing lots of muscovite. We started to look at some elemental data collected from the SEM. And what I did was I found this vein here. I'm like, oh, well, that's, that's a pretty obvious kind of this sub-horizontal micro vein. And it's within a, bit, a layer of euhedral pyrite. And I took this transect across the vein going from A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And, you know, it's obvious that surrounding this vein is what we're calling an alteration halo. And the vein, the big trend that I noticed was that, look at down here, we have a, an aluminum, the relatively aluminum rich. And this is all pretty much pyrite down here. And as you move away from the vein, the concentrations of the aluminum or the elemental, the percent of the aluminum steadily decreases. So we have this aluminum rich vein and halo within a euhedral pyrite layer. We also have calcium plagioclase rich veins. So this is a, here's a picture from the petrographic microscope and this is in the um, Geneseo formation. And just from the several, uh, you know, EDS, the elemental uh, sample or measurements that we took, it's all calcium plagioclase, which I know this is like a semi-quantitative way to, to uh, classify the elemental composition, but it's still plagioclase filled uh, veins, which is something I never noticed in, in any of my experience looking at this sort of stuff. Um, we also see all, another alteration uh, feature, sphalerite. So sphalerite is all this light colored here, surround, surrounding quartz here, that is then right next to pyrite in this location D. And all of this is a quartz clay ground mass, um, you know, of, of the shale. And all of these little, uh, you know, kind of circular blobs there are what are called pyrite framboids, which are a depositional feature. And this wasn't stuff that we were expecting to see. So some of the you know, kind of questions or observations, interpretations is that it seems like there were hot fluids that were flowing through these, um, through this portion, um, through this XY point uh, in the Rome trough. And we see it in, in some other, um, in some other data sets too, like um, something called vitronite reflectance, which kind of measures the, the, the maturity of the reservoir, um, gets, gets overcooked when you're kind of close to these fluids. So were there hot fluids flowing through or along these, either these basement root at faults or cross structural discontinuities? Um, what are the ages of those, right? Anywhere from post-Acadian orogeny and like burial associated uh, fluid flow, or is it more in, are they stratigraphically controlled? Because we do see differences in the bulk mineralogy. We see plagioclase veins in the upper Devonian, um, and we don't see those in the middle Devonian. So these faults are playing a pretty significant role in the reservoir quality and the mineralogy of these Devonian shales. So they're, I think they're playing a role in the stratigraphy or this structure, this Rome trough structure is playing a role in the stratigraphy. It's playing a role in um, the mineralogy and possibly the reservoir quality. And, you know, seeing the time here, I'm just going to touch on this. This is kind of a whole nother project, um, but I, I want to touch on it just pretty quickly because I think it's important for geologists to know, and especially young geologists who are probably a lot more uh, tech and computer savvy than I am, is to expand your, you know, expand your vision beyond just the typical geologic data sets, right? Like well logs and core and outcrops. We, we've looked at at all of those for parts of this project. Um, but the one thing I wanted to do was data mine all available data from some of these well fields and data mining, extracting potentially useful information and patterns from large data sets 
by using various computational methods. And by me, me being a big geologist, my computational, computational methods to extract some of this data are pretty rudimentary. Like sometimes it's me really just loading stuff into a spreadsheet and, and sorting through it that way, as opposed to like what an actual computer scientist would do. But there's a lot of data out there and some of it's to the public. And I think it's important for us to start thinking, how can we use this data to really understand earth processes? Um, and one thing we, I did was then incorporate it into something called a geo model. And all a geo model is, and this looks confusing over here, right? It's just, a, it, it, has, it has to do with a bunch of, you know, math and statistics, but you're just creating this computerized volume and trying to represent the actual geology in this computerized volume that's represented by numbers, right? And that sounds like, oh, that's something a computer scientist would do, but it's not. Because in order to do this sort of stuff, geologists have to have a, a very good understanding of depositional environments, of what the structure is like in the area, of what um, the stratigraphy is like in the area. Because computers, oh, you can train them, right? And that's a big thing, you know, like, uh, you know, training artificial intelligence. But I, what computers can't do is come, Enter the enter this uh, you know numerical world with a geologic concepts right. You need an accurate stratigraphy and accurate structural model to make accurate geo models. Um, so let's just show you some of what some of the data that we were looking at. This is a well field here. It's located right here, kind of in in the northern. West Virginia section of the Rome Trough. And we're looking down on this well field and each one of these, like it looks like a bunch of fingers going to the Northwest and fingers going to the Southeast. Each one of those is looking down on a horizontal well path. And each one of these green blobs along the well path is a place where they fractured the unconventional reservoir. All of these wells were drilled into the Marcellus Formation. So we're talking about like, you know, maybe 6,000 feet below the surface. You can see that there are black lines over here. Those wells were never completed. And that was initially just due to logistical changes in like, you know, the, the scheduling of, uh, of where they were going to frack next. But the big thing I'd like you folks to take note of is this red, these red arrows here. And that is, what we're mapping as a strike slip fault. And that's just based on some of the data that was collected while these wells were being drilled. We did not have any seismic data or anything like that. Um, there's little red uh, uh, circles on the edges of these wells, and that's showing how those wells produced. And it basically, a green well means that it was produced, the green ball means that it has really good production. Uh, red ball means that it has bad production. Oranges and yellows are kind of me medium. And as we're approaching the strike slip fault, you're kind of noticing this trend that is going like, it looks like production trends increase and then decrease as you approach this. And it's the same over here. We have production trends kind of increasing, going from reds to greens and then decreasing. And it's, it's interesting, well, we'll look more at some of the data for, um, engineering data from around that. So to make these models, it's really just making, you're making this 3D grid in a computer and you're filling it with a bunch of numbers based on statistics from this, from your well logs or from your well core. And it's actually, you know, it's, it's taken me a very long time to learn how to do this properly. But again, I think the important thing is, is you need to have a geologist to do this properly. You cannot have a computer to do this, do this properly because they don't have knowledge in earth systems. This is again looking at the same, um, we're looking at the same well field, but we have all these different colors behind it. And I, I, what I wish is I would have uh, just, just don't pay attention to this picture and don't pay attention to this picture. over here. Just look at this center picture over here. This is those treating pressures, the pressure that it takes to fracture the reservoir rock. And the Blues are relatively low pressures, about 6,000 PSI. The reds are higher pressures, over 9,000 PSI. And you can see there's this really steady um, pressure increase from the east to the west in this field. 
And note that that's kind of the same thing that we saw with these production trends. It seems to be affected as you're moving, uh, you know, kind of westward throughout the field towards a strike slip fault, which is right here. So as you get closer to the strike slip fault, you need higher pressures to uh, fracture these unconventional reservoirs. You see similar things with, tr with drilling data. So all I did was I pretended that this engineering data was geologic data and kind of distributed it throughout this model and did the same thing with, so, so it's treating this engineering data as a proxy for geology. And this is showing how fast you could, the, these wells were drilled. And as you're moving from east to west throughout the field, these, these wells drill very fast over here, on, up to 400 feet per, uh, or this says feet or meters, feet or meters per hour. So high, the reds are high, very fast drilling. The blues are low, around 100 feet per hour. Um, as you approach this strike slip fault, and then once you get to the west, the southwest of the strike slip fault, the, the drilling rates get faster again, at least in these northbound wells. What we see over here is what's called these dog leg severities. How fast or how much of a change do we see in the drill bit? And we see lots of blues, light blues over here. And once you get within the strike slip fault, you're seeing more changes in this bit. So I think that what we can conclude from this is that these, um, these faults are affecting within the Rome trough are affecting a lot of things, right? It's affecting the Devonian shale geology. I'm looking at the ge Devonian shale geology because that's kind of a hot topic, right? It's not, I don't think it's fair to limit uh, trying to understand the effect of these faults on all the rocks though, right? Why limit it to Devonian shale? Um, so that's something I'm going to look at in the future is like, let's, let's extend at least throughout the Devonian, all the rock types. It's the sequence stratigraphy changes um, and depot center change within the Rome trough. They're different between the Marcellus and the uh, Geneseo formations. Does a more complete stratigraphic record exist in portions of the trough that have like remnant subsidence or mechanical predisposition for localized fracturings and subsidence? I don't know. This is, these are the questions, you know, if anyone knows the answer. I'd be, I'd love to hear it. Um, areas with a less developed stratigraphic record may be indicative of sediment starve regions as pr Professor Schiappa said, you know, paleo topography, how did that play a role? I think, I think that's spot on. That played a role in where and when these uh, depot centers were uh, located in the trough. Um, and then not all Devonian shales are the same. Possible, I think, hot fluids are flowing along some of these faults and cross-structural discontinuities, but where, when, and how? And it's important to um, look at, use these geo models and, and expand the data that you're looking at. Look at engineering data. Can you use it as a proxy for understanding, you know, the geology and stress regimes of the area? What, what's causing the drilling and the completion uh, data to, to change around that strike slip fault. Well, and the production too, I don't know. Is it changes in the stress regime? Is it changes in mineralogy? Maybe there were you know, different mineralogy along that, it looks like a cross-structural discontinuity. Um, is the production less there because stress regimes change there and they're not effectively stimulating the rock? Or, is it so fractured around these rock, these faults that a lot of the gas leaked off? So again, we can use these the data mining and geo model vis, visualizations to represent different data sets. But I think it again provide there's lots of questions raised by it. But the most important thing is is you need the geologist perspective to use some of these uh, these modeling tools. I don't know what it says. Oh, yeah, we can use engineering. I think that down here it just says we can use engineering data to, um, to understand what the geology is doing. So we have this wealth of information gathered from, from all these oil and gas wells that were drilled in the basin. And I think whether, whether you like the drilling or not, 
it's it's a treasure trove for geologists if you can get your hands on it. And it really will provide provide such an important perspective in understanding how our basin, and then especially I'm looking at this Rome trough, evolved throughout you know, the Paleozoic. And, and, and how do those features, the faults, and, and affect our, our sedimentation, our stratigraphy, our depot centers, fluid flow, and then even present day um, stress fields. So that's all I have. Look at 101. I uh, almost wrapped it up in an hour. I know that and the end of that was pretty fast. Um, so I apologize for that. I probably bit off more than I more I bit off more than I could chew um, adding that geo model stuff. But if anyone has any questions, I'd um, I'd be happy to hear them. That was great. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was really good. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, did you, um, so where did you, what geomodeling program are you using? It is called Petrel. And it's made by a company, it was a company called Schlumberger. Right, Schlumberger's project, product. It's a Schlumberger product and it's something that we got donated to the college. So, it, and, I will say it's a pretty, I used to work for Schlumberger, so that's why like I could kind of, it, it took me a, three years of working there to kind of understand how to use, how to use it. Yeah. But it, it's a kind of, it's a thing that they, they, they do donate to colleges or they used to. I don't know what things are like right now with, um, you know, the way, the way the oil and gas world is, but. Um, right. But yeah, yeah, it's using that and, and it's really, um, it's, it's a re really powerful tool. Julie, are you gonna end the recording? Whenever, yeah, whenever we're done, I certainly can end it. Okay, I didn't know if you were or if, you, if I needed to or. Patrick had to go to office hours, so he right. had to, to, yeah. to drop off, but I was waiting to see if there were any other questions, yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't have any, any, but that's a great project. It's, I, I, I yeah, I covered, tried to, I should have probably cut out that computer stuff, but Tamara, you were someone I was thinking about when I'm like, you know, scratching my head with some of these micro fossils and stuff like that. I mean, some of them are so deformed and smushed, like, I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't know, but, um, you know, there's definitely differences throughout the what I could see throughout the Devonian um yeah I I think you know I, I see some of these same differences in Nevada I've seen and um a lot of it has to do with paleo topography so you know the river systems are entering these troughs but and they're pulling in sediment from different areas and then they get kind of isolated in different parts of the basin so they you know, in one part of the basin, you know, you're getting sediments derived from one part of the origin and the other part of the basin, even though they're close to each other. They're know, totally, yeah. They're Maybe totally different. They're getting different, a, a different sediment signature. And then because they're also getting a different, they're all, they may be one maybe deeper than the other. So the biologic is different as well. So you may get deeper water organisms oh, yeah, in yeah. one area of the basin versus shallow, not, not real shallow, but organisms that aren't classified as real deep in okay. another part of the basin. So that's what made me think of what- No, I think, I think you're exactly right. And I think that something that people don't talk, I think there's a probably a westward sor uh, source that's coming from the west from that like Cincinnati arch that you know I don't I don't really know how to say say that that's so and I think during all of, you know you know the Acadian Arajri that that trough like I'm showing a bunch of like big faults but if you look at size like you know localized size but it is it is so messed up in there and I'm sure yeah. there were like version structures and, and stuff like that. And I'm realizing as I'm going through this project, I'm like, I don't know if I really have like the manpower to get all the wells in there, like the, de you know, high enough density of wells to figure out exactly what's going on. But, but yeah, I think, I think what you said is exact. That's, I think you're spot on with that. And, and you know, you're probably getting some sediment from the Craton too, that, yep. 
right? So you're, you're getting the yeah. source from the north or what is now the north from the Acadian and then from the Cincinnati Arch region too. So you're getting this combination and probably a lot of the carbonates are coming from the Cincinnati Arch. Yeah, you know, and that's what I've seen like as you move throughout the throughout the Devonian, it looks like things get thicker as you go to the north. So it looks like that might have been the, the primary route of sediment. But again, I'm... Well, because I know in the Pennsylvanian, a lot of the sediment in the sands that are making up like the Catanning sandstone around here, a lot of that sediment is the origination is from the Craton. Okay. Yep. So, so you would think that these paleo rivers are persisting throughout the Paleozoic. You know, there's, there's a preferred transportation path. And I think they're, I think they might just be persistent over throughout the Paleozoic. I know we're talking about, you know, hundreds of millions of years, but I still think these paleo channels are persistent. Okay. I don't know. I don't know yeah. that for a fact, but it wouldn't surprise me if they if there's were. Something. No, there's definitely like, I think I, in the upper Devonian, it looks like things are more sourced to the north, from the north. And, yep. you know, everyone says, oh, sourced from the east, from the Acadian Highlands. And I do, it's a lot more complicated, but I don't really know. I mean, I guess you can get zircons if you have, like, I don't know. How, I've never done that and stuff, you know. Do you have detrital zircons at all? I found there's some in, like, they've seen some in thin sections. I would, I think, are, you know. So I think there are, yes. I think that you, if you're lucky, it, it's not like ubiquitous throughout the whole section, but I've seen some. Yeah, because you could do analysis on them to see the source. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's just adding to the project. Here you go. Well, it is. No, but I think it's cool. It's also like, you, you need you need some money a little bit at least but um, right you do yeah. need money <laughs> yeah yeah but I, I think you're right I think I, that's something to think about getting some going back and looking for zircons I think the thing that I'm looking at right now is is I'd like to get some fo sample veins in these cores and figure out a like kind of age populations is, mm, yeah when when were these calcite filled veins formed when were these pyrite lenses that's what i was like all oh, this euhedral pyrite and big lenses with stuff going through it is it really you know more of that like mississippi valley type stuff that we're seeing here and when did that happen right a lot younger too i mean you see all these like, young igneous intrusions because it'd be associated with that stuff too so yeah, that's that's caused so many questions. Yeah, it does. I mean, that's what it, it really just opens. So you could have a bunch of little projects that your students can work on, which is really cool. Yeah, hopefully, if we can get get back into the lab to do stuff. That right. Be, yeah. Are you guys back on campus actually, next semester? We've been back. We've 